Hello, it's Steve Schneeberger again with video number four of our seven part series on the Richfield point of sale inspection. Hope you've uh, stuck with me so far and uh, you learned a few things in that last video about exterior items. And uh, in this video, we're gonna really launch into what, what uh, the inspectors look for on the inside of the house. Now I will remind you again is if um, you do want me to come and do a walkthrough of your house, if you're thinking about selling, and you want to have me come through and do kind of a quick once over and and uh, see what I see, I would be happy to do that. I don't charge for it. It's something I enjoy doing. I learn something every time I go through a house. And you can just click on the, the top right button there that says schedule a, a walkthrough, and I'd be happy to do that. But this video here is we're really gonna get into the meat of what the inspector looks for. And starting with probably the most common most important items and moving into the more uh, minutia, as it were. The first thing that we look at is smoke and carbon monoxide detectors. The rule with smoke and CO detectors is there must be a smoke detector in each sleeping room, regardless of what level that room is on. So if it's in the basement with an egress window, you have to have one in there. If, they, if, you have your, if you're in a story and a half, and you use your upper level, even though it's open for, you know, that's a bed area, a bedroom. There has to be a smoke detector in there as well. Also, there has to be a smoke detector in addition to inside the bedroom. There has to be one in a hallway outside of the sleeping rooms. So, for example, in your on your main level of your story and a half or a rambler, you likely have a little hallway that within 10 feet of each direction, there's a bedroom. There has to be a smoke detector in that area as well. We also have to have a carbon monoxide detector within 10 feet of any sleeping room. So what a lot of people do in that area on the main level where you've got multiple rooms next to each other, you can just put in a smoke carbon monoxide combo detector and that'll be just perfect for that area. And then you must have a, a smoke detector, one, one per floor, one per floor. Carbon monoxide, again, one for any floor where there's actually sleeping rooms located. But these are really common. The inspector will actually test them all. So if you've pulled out the batteries or your batteries aren't working, they're dead, go ahead and pop new batteries in there because they will test every single one of the detectors to make sure they work. A couple of things about fireplaces. For those of you who have fireplaces in your home, First thing, there must be some sort of a screen in front of it, regardless of whether you use it or don't for really actually burning fires. You know, even if you've got some decorative candles in here, um, they might actually say that you have to put a screen in front of it just because it is an active um, fireplace. The other thing is if they're back, this is called the firebox. So this area back here where the fires burn, this is just, these are blocks back here that have mortar in between them, kind of like, you know, your foundation. If there are significant cracks in the mortar between your, your block, that's gonna have to be fixed too because that could lead to a, a potential fire hazard. The other thing that is, um, I, I kind of think this is the most, the most annoying thing in these inspections from my standpoint. And this isn't a Richfield thing. This is actually a state of Minnesota fire code thing. But basically the rule is that there has to be a hard surface, a minimum of 16 inches away from any kind of a fireplace. So I put 16 to 20 here, 16 is the bare minimum. So this fireplace was built back before this code existed. And it just has this little um, a little spot here, it's probably about 12 inches where it's a little apron for the fireplace. This is not um, wide enough. And because there was originally carpet here, theoretically, if you were burning a wood fire and you had the screens open, a, an ember could pop out of here and shoot past this little ledge and get onto the carpet and, and burn the carpet or start a fire. So what we had to do in this case is my handyman literally, whoops, sorry, uh, pulled out a piece of the carpet, 
put in the ceramic tile, patched the cat carpet back down, glued it back down, and made this surround. I, I think it looks ugly, but um, you know this happens quite a bit in Richfield. Now, if you have a, a fireplace in your basement, for example, and you've got carpet in your basement, I've seen it be, you know, if you've got old crappy carpeting, I've seen where uh, homeowners will just literally cut a piece of carpet out about 16 inches away from where the fireplace is. And likely beneath that carpet, you'll have the original tile of your basement. That tile is considered to be fire resistant. So that would suffice the same as the ceramic tile surround wood. So in a pinch, it's not pretty, but if you're, if you're selling mom and dad's house and they have old shade carpeting downstairs, it's probably gonna be ripped out by the new buyer anyway. You could maybe just cut out a piece of that carpet around there and just expose that tile that was the original to the house. Other thing is a loose toilet. Um, you know, if you if you wiggle your toilet and it, it wobbles, that um, could be a potential problem because that means that it's not secure to the floor. And over time, that wobbling can lead to a deterioration of the connection from your toilet to the pipe, and that can lead to water seeping out around the base of your toilet. So not only does it have to be secure to the floor, but it also has to have a bead of, of silicone around the base of it just to prevent water. Uh, damage. Now this is an interesting one. Uh, for those of you who have story and a half houses, there's a minimum 36 inch wall height required for this little half wall that's, that's kind of right next to your stairs coming up. A lot of houses were built not to that particular code. And so I, I put a couple pictures in here of kind of a, a uh, bare, bare bones solution and a really fancy solution on how to solve that problem. So in this case here, this, this wall actually was only about 30 inches tall. And because it had to be 36, simply what they did is they just st stood a two by six up on its side, ran it down here, put a couple pieces of frame around it. Just as long as it's 36 inches from here down to the floor, it's good enough for Richfield. Now this homeowner decided he wanted to do something super fancy. So he had this actually hand crafted by a metalworks company and welded and all painted and polished up. And he uh, put these on the top of his um, uh, half wall here in order to get that 36 inch height. So a few different ways to do it. Going downstairs, a couple of things with a water heater. This is a discharge pipe here. So the, the city likes to see this be copper. Now in this case, it's a galvanized steel, and I think this one actually passed, but ideally this should be a copper pipe. But more importantly, the termination point has to be 18 inches or less from the floor. Now what this is, is if for some reason the water heater malfunctions and overheats, um, the water that will come steaming out and out this little safety valve and it'll shoot out down to the floor versus spraying out here and hitting somebody in the face. So this has to be in place. It has to be less than 18 inches from the floor so it doesn't spray all over somebody. Um, that's about it with that. They do check the gas lines if it's a gas water heater just to make sure they're connected properly. With the laundry tubs, whether you have the old cement version or one of these newer versions, the, um, well, with the cement version, it's gonna obviously be, it'll be, it'll be attached to the floor because it weighs a thousand pounds. But a lot of people have replaced them with these newer ones. And all of these legs, you know, the, you have to be able to fasten these to the ground so that this tub doesn't wiggle. If it wiggles and wobbles, then this drain pipe might be compromised and it could lead to some leaking out of the out of the plumbing waistline. So the way to do this is you don't have to necessarily drill holes into the concrete. What I recommend is just getting a big huge goop of like gorilla glue and just putting a bunch under each of these four legs and just pressing it down onto the concrete and that'll glue it down strong enough so that you're not going to have to worry about the problem. It just if you jiggle it it just has to be solid.
One of the more common things to look at too, this is for both Richfield and if it's FHA financed, is the railings, stair railings. And I put this picture in because there's a couple different things going on here. Number one is the inspector wanted this handrail to go all the way down to the bottom of the steps. So the homeowner had to take off this original one, run this one all the way down to the bottom in order to comply with what they wanted. Um, the other thing too that sometimes I see, and it's not a problem with this house here because this, this little half wall is tall enough, but I did this with my first Richfield house and I didn't know any differently. I decided I wanted to open this area up just to kind of make the steps open into the family room. And I cut back my wall right here. Well, if you have more than three steps exposed here without a, a railing or something or a wall, Richfield will want you to fix that and either wall it up or put spindles on it or something because this is a falling hazard for a, maybe a toddler could fall off of it. The first three steps are okay. So one, two, three, you could have it open up to here, but from here on up, this has to be walled. <clears throat> With gas lines, if, if you have an unused gas line, it has to be capped. This is actually a, a dryer that was taken out of this house. So, you know, likely they're going to put another dryer in here. If you were to install a dryer before you put your house on the market, you just, you know, hook this up, of course. But in this case, it had to be capped off because it was just leading to nowhere. And then with these ducts, um, this is a dryer vent. First of all, they have to be metal. They can't be that plastic, kind of that accordion plastic material because that's potentially a fire hazard. But it can be either the smooth metal or this looks like a little bit of a corrugated metal here, that works. Now the thing is, you, to the connection points has to be, they have to be um, done with foil tape and not duct tape, because the foil tape actually sticks better and the duct tape you can just um, use for whatever else, the million other reasons that you use it for, but it can't be used on these uh, metal pipes anymore. Couple things with electrical. Now, all of the houses that have been built in modern day, they have the what they call the ground fault circuit interrupters or GFCIs or GFIs. They're called many different ways to refer to them. Those are those outlets where you've got the little push buttons in between the plugins where you can trip it and then press the other button and it resets. And those are designed to be near places either outside or near sources of water, your kitchen sink, your bathroom sink, your laundry sink. They should be the GFCI outlets. However, if you haven't um, you know, upgraded your house or remodeled your kitchen or bathroom, and you still have those, those just simple three-prong outlets, they will be okay. Richfield will not make you put the GFIs in, but if you do have them, they have to, they have to be working. So they'll, they'll trip it, make sure that it works, and, and so they will test the, G, the, the GFIs that are in place already. I mentioned when we were talking about the garage, the extension cords in place of permanent wiring. Oftentimes I'll see this in basements where maybe there's a, work, a workshop or a workbench where there's a, um, a fluorescent fixture that's, that's hanging from the ceiling and it has a cord that plugs into an outlet somewhere. That for some reason those just aren't permitted or allowed. So the simple fix for that is just to remove that fixture, just take it completely down for the inspection. Also exterior outlets without a cover. Now the, the exterior, of course, that, that those outlets are kind of subject to the elements. And so they do need to have a cover on them in order for, to prevent water from coming in them. The other thing with the, the electrical the service panel or your, your, your breaker box or whatever you call it, it's the big gray box down somewhere usually in your basement where all your breakers are, or in some cases fuses. There has to be a 36 inch clearance around the front of that. So in other words, you can't have shelving units in front of it or around it or, or covering it. There just has to be a clear access to that, that breaker panel. 
And then the other thing is your bathroom must have at least one outlet. And you're thinking, well, of, of course it has an outlet. But believe it or not, some of the bathrooms, the really tiny ones that were built, the outlet would have been on the connected to the light fixture. So if you maybe had an overhead light fixture and there's a the little two-prong outlet up there to plug in your hair dryer or what have you, that that would suffice if you still have that. But a lot of people have taken out that light fixture with the plug-in attached to it, and they've just simply replaced it with another light fixture, leaving the bathroom without an outlet, or, uh, period. And so you'll, you'll have to do some sort of a, a fix to either install an outlet. It can oftentimes, it can be just put in next to your light switch and get a, an electrician in there to add it. And then you can put a cover that covers both the outlet and the light switch when one piece covers it all. But the bathroom does have to have at least one outlet. Again, it doesn't have to be GFI protected unless it is uh, has been added after the fact or it's a, it's a newer addition. <clears throat> and then for those outlets that you have in your house that are the three prong outlet, the inspector will go through and check, just kind of spot check various outlets throughout your house. They won't check every single one, but they use this little um, outlet tester to see if the wires are hooked up correctly. So sometimes that's reverse polarity, meaning negative is hooked to positive and vice versa. And that will show up here on this little tester as an incorrect wiring um, uh, configuration, or if it's not grounded, or just if there's a few different things that can go wrong with these. And if there are issues with them, then they'll check that, and then you'll have to have an electrician come and fix them. It's, they're not really big deals. If you have an open junction box, that, that is a relatively big deal because those could be live wires in there. So they'll just ask you to get a cover, use probably a buck at a hardware store, and, and just screw that in. There's screws already there ready to cover that up. And then this is kind of goofy too, but this is a, actually a metal chain. And I don't know, this is, like I said, kind of, kind of weird, but this has to be string. That can't be metal. I guess it's just a conductive thing. You could maybe get a shock. I don't know. But you you'll, you can go to a big box hardware store, you know, Home Depot, Menards, whatever, and buy these little things. They clip right in here at the top. Instead of this little ball chain, it's just a string that goes all the way down to the bottom. They're probably 50 cents. That would, that would also be the case, too, if you have, um, let's just say, pole chain... Um, Fans, ceiling fans, sometimes I'll see that called where they, they need the string versus this metal chain. A couple things about this picture. Number one, the you'll see this wire here. This is called the jumper wire. So this is the ground that comes from the service panel, that gray breaker box. And this wire runs all the way down to connect to your plumbing to your main water line. It's clamped above the water meter here. It's clamped above and it's clamped below. And that's designed to ground your house in case it got struck by lightning. Theoretically, the lightning electricity would shoot through this wire and go straight into the ground uh, instead of burning your house down. So this has to be in place above and below the water meter. Um, the other thing I'll just mention here is this is a basement wall, obviously. This is a styrofoam piece of insulation wall material. If you have um, exposed insulation, it either has to be removed or covered with drywall. I'm, I'm guessing it's maybe for fire hazard reasons. So in this case, a couple things to look at. One would be this, this has to be covered with drywall in order for it to pass code or just removed. We can't have open light bulbs in closets. And this picture is actually my house. This is in my master bedroom. The inspector who did this inspection before I bought it just completely missed this. But this light bulb is literally a couple inches from this wall. And for obvious reasons, you don't want hot burning light bulbs next to a wall this close. So the fix for something like this um, actually 
had they seen this, and I don't use this uh, that often. First of all, I put an LED light in there, and those just, they don't burn hot at all. So that's probably going to solve any kind of problem. But secondarily, um, you'd have to get a fixture where there's a globe that can be put around the light bulb just to give it protection. So um, let me just go back here again. This case, this wouldn't work because the globe wouldn't even fit in this space. But, you know, um, just something that will prevent the, the light bulb from potentially casting heat onto the walls around it. Moving into plumbing, a couple things to look at there. If you have a slow or clogged drain, the, the inspector will just turn on the faucet and let it run for a few seconds to make sure the water drains out fine. If it is slow or backs up or it's clogged, you will need to fix that. And then um, the leaking waste lines or faucets, and the waste line is basically the drain that comes down underneath your sink. Or if your faucet is dripping, you know, around maybe where the shutoff valve is, those will have to be replaced or fixed. And then leaking toilets, I did mention that earlier. Um, you know, they have to be, not only do they have to be tight to the floor, but they can't have water kind of seeping out from underneath them. And then this was a, a kind of a homeowner special. These little uh, kind of accordion, that's like a straw, you know, those bendable straws. This is not permitted in a plumbing apparatus. Um, it has to be smooth, the smooth line. And so, you know, to get this to be right, a plumber would have to come out and take out this little bendy piece, kind of smooth this out, get that trap to connect and, and have it all one seamless connection. You know, technically things can get caught up in here and it just create, creates a, a clogging problem. Flex line. This picture is really tough to figure out what, what we're getting at here. But basically, this is underneath the kitchen sink. And this, this line in here is the waste line that comes from the dishwasher. So when your dishwasher is, is um, pushing out the water to drain it, it comes through this little hose. The hose actually has to go up and then before it goes down. So this is kind of a backflow preventing thing as well. And so if this hose just running straight across here, that is incorrect. It does have to actually go up and probably be pinned or attached somewhere up here into this little section and then come down into your main drain, which goes out down through your sink and down to the floor. Shower assembly like this will not fly because this is a, again, this potentially could be a backflow hazard. So if you took this handle off and let this all dangle down, you know, it could probably fall into a, a full tub of water. They call that a potential threat for backflow. And so the simple fix for this one here is just take this whole thing off and put a fixed shower head on here for the inspection. That way the, the, the water will just come out the, the main shower head. This whole thing can be gone and you're going to be just good to go there. Super simple. I don't think many of you have this, but <laughs> I grew up on a farm and this is how we took a shower back in my day. Um, this was actually a makeshift shower. This is the hot and cold and the shower head here. And this just this just literally drained out down into the floor and down into the, the main drain here. First of all, if you have a shower downstairs, you can't let the water just go to this drain. It actually has to have a separate drain that goes into the floor and then the drain in the floor has to some ultimately connect to this this waste line here. But uh, also, um, and that was the main reason this one was not allowed because it didn't have its own dedicated drain, but obviously nobody's going to use this. So what had to happen here is the homeowner had to cut these, have a plumber come and cut these lines and cap them so that the water could no longer be used here. Oh, yeah, here's another picture. I mentioned this earlier, but um, so this is that foam insulation that has to be covered up, removed. Sometimes I'll see where people will put that in their little well room because they like to maybe make it a wine cellar or store, a, you know, a canned goods or whatever, um, you know, but they don't want it to be super cold. 
and they'll just put the either this pink the pink um, foam or this kind of foam in there and that'll you know, although it does it provide some insulating properties you you will need to either cover that up with drywall or take it out and there you go um, that's the last slide of this particular video so thanks for sticking with me I hope that you got some good information there again if you are wanting to have me come out and take a look at your home and give you a quick little walkthrough, happy to do that. Just click on the top right here on that little red button and be happy to set up a time for you. Thanks so much and uh, buckle in for the last coming uh, videos, a couple left. So thanks for sticking with me.